things you do should look beautiful. And it is important for diagnosis purpose. Definitely it's important for marketing purpose. It's important for your malpractice uh, safety and it's rewarding for yourself. So it's something your photography should be very good so that um, it gives you a lot of satisfactions, right? Um, and even it look professional when you do your job. So why we need photos as we discuss, it help in patient education because if you treat something, it become a um, tool for you to present it to the second patient. It gives the patients comforts that you already know the problem and you have gone through it so they can trust you uh, well. So in starting a new practice, make sure from everything, do photography. There are thousands of photos which are not useful, but um, what I tell you now is everything on a cloud. So get your good storage of clouds and try to take as much photography as you can. And over the period of time, when you become old, each photos, you know where to place and how to place, okay? So whatever photography you are doing is not useless. Everything will work for you at any stage. When you do the clinical cases every day, every patient picture you can take, you will feel at some point that why I'm taking it's just not moved. But when you see a complete case, you will see the difference, how it moves and what difference every visit has made for you uh, in your photography. So without asking any questions, just follow the rule that whatever work you do, take a picture before doing, after doing, and then save it in a place where you can retrieve it. So um, save it always in a digital format, in a cloud, okay? Or in a Dropbox, that is the best way to do it. So you know that where to place it, how to place it, because uh, if you're putting in the computer or any hardware, make sure you have a backup always ready. Uh, it also helps in a clinical investigation of uh, especially how the cranial facial structures are, how the dental relationships are. It helps you to discuss your case with your peers and asking for the expert opinion. It helps to self-check your progress by comparing pre and post treatment, by looking at the progress pictures. It helps uh, to document the patient condition before starting a treatment, which save you from liability, uh, liability concern, especially in braces, there is a lot of liabilities like damage of the gingiva, damage of soft tissue, white spot legend, cleft damage during treatment, uh, change of the facial features, uh, especially in the surgical orthodontics. So it's very important that every um, facial asymmetries become either more prominent or will become a worsen or get better in either of the condition, uh, progress pictures should be taken. It also help you to teach your peers by giving lectures, case presentations for marketing, for international presentations, okay? And whenever you utilize it publicly, then make sure you take a patient consent. So when you're taking the pictures, you should keep the consent form for uh, sharing the pictures to the publications and social media uh, available. So you don't need to go back to the patient and ask them for that. Try to avoid patient face pictures wherever you are uh, using it for marketing purposes, just save you. Uh, hassle unless you have a clear social media consent form ready. So for good photography, there is certain requirements, how you can do. These tools are very important. You should have a good camera system. Um, today's smartphones are good, but they are not perfect. They are not what um, needed uh, actually because you know, when you go for the publication, they need a certain uh, macro requirement, macro lens requirement. Some pictures which are not printable, so your whole uh, treatment would not be considered for publication if your photographs are not um, of clear dimension. So clinical pictures as a rule should be taken with professional camera.
other pictures, pictures for marketing, pictures for social medias, you can take from your phone. But when you document it, anything should be in a process, in the old fashioned with a camera system, with the retractors on all the time. Don't use the fingers. Retractors are the very cheap nowadays. You can just get it from Amazon or somewhere from the suppliers, but make sure the retractors, mirrors, the oral mirrors, they are compulsory things and a good lightning system. I usually don't keep any, I don't focus on the last part because uh, when I designed my clinic, I have put a very big light on the top of the uh, dental chair. It's a white light and I have a window in front and I always uh, switch off my dental clinic light. So if you have a good lightning in a clinic place, you don't need additional lightning, photographic lightning. Your camera will set up for it, okay? So coming to the camera, what camera you want um, and you should need it. So there are three types of camera. The one is normal camera, digital cameras, which we don't use. The other ones are semi-digital and the third one are DSLR, okay? So DSLR are uh, one where the lenses can be removed and put on. They are highly professional cameras. They are the camera actually uh, we should use it, okay? But there is an option, you can use semi-digital cameras, okay? Now the semi-digital one, uh, they, they have a lens which is can't be removed, but they have a wide lens like macro up to um, certain extent that you can use it with confidence. So personally speaking, if you're doing any aesthetics work, like you want to see the difference in the shade uh, and sh shade where you need a certain lightning condition to compare pre and post, then it is important that you use DSLR, okay? But when you're doing the orthodontics where you are not dealing with a shade issue, okay, your requirement will be fulfilled with the semi-professional uh, cameras, okay? In which you have a good lens, but the lens can be attached. Now, why I'm telling you to buy the mid-range, because I personally use a mid-range, I never use DSLR, because I never find the need for it. And the one which I use is Olympus one, uh, uh, the company which is Olympus, and um, it has a battery and it is a, a is a very uh, big zoom and the macro lens, which I needed. And for the pictures which you printed are appropriate quality that can be accepted in any international publication. And it is very quick to use. You don't need to remove the lens, do anything. It is like one camera with everything. Um, and it gives you very perfect result. Uh, I can share with you what I'm using it. You can even use the Sony as well, and you can use the Nikon. So in our uh, residency, what we have been recommended was the Nikon, okay? But Nikon semi-adjustable was uh, the gold standard at that time. Then the technologies have changed and the other cameras have come into the place. So when we came, we have an option of Olympus and uh, Sony. So I bought the Olympus. It is very economical and it's easy. The only problem which I find with my camera is that I have to use, uh, it doesn't have a battery. It has a rechargeable cells. So every time after a few years, the cells become bad and then I have to buy new recycled cell. And each cells, I need to take it out and charge it. If you have a battery, it's everything will charge in one go. So that's the only, uh, difference but in terms of quality it is good now coming to uh the macro lens it is always good that it's more than 90 millimeter now this is 90 millimeter you get only in the dslr okay uh in semi-professional um i think i have 30 millimeter one and macro lens is for zoom and focus okay the more uh, you want a uh, focus um, and zoom photography, you need a macro lens. So for aesthetic reasons, we need a very good macro lens for now we are dealing not with a, a mini aesthetics, we're dealing with a macro aesthetics in which we see the alignment of the teeth and the cross movement of the teeth. So even 
the 30 millimeter macro lenses also work very nicely. Okay, but if you're already in a, a position that you expose yourself to the DSLR and you are very ready to learn, then try to learn using this camera. It gives you awesome results. They have, and always you, you need to have a good flash. The ideal flash is ring flash. You can you put it in any of your camera system. Uh, it's something detachable that you can buy and put it up. Then there is an automatic flash, which usually it says should be avoided uh, because in an automatic flash, there is a shadows come on the side. So you need a very good lighting on the side. Then you can use uh, automatic flash. Otherwise, the ring flash is the ideal. Um, the camera should have an internal flash, which is not uh, present in our cell phone or it's not present in uh, the digital camera. It's only present in the semi-professional and uh, professional cameras, which is called as red light. This internal flash gives the beautiful result. So this we get it in the Olympus brand. Then we have a studio light. Um, it depends. If you have a very good lighting in your clinic, you don't need a studio light but you can always have it if you want very beautiful pictures with no shadows. So to avoid shadows, we need a studio light, but if you can manage and you have good skill with uh, photography and you know how to manage your shadows by playing with the light sources available, then you don't need all this expensive stuff, okay? And always you have to do uh, photographs in the daylight not in the um, with the dental center uh, dental uh, chair light. Okay. Also, your camera system should have a manual uh, f stop and the manual focus. So this f stop is a f length focal length that you can adjust it what length you want, and the manual focus should be there so you know how much to zoom or not to zoom. So what is it? You can see what is the f-stop and what difference does it make? So the greater the depth of the focus, the greater uh, the details you can see. So how you get this f-stop? By having a macro lens. So your camera should have a manually, you can zoom in and zoom out to adjust the f-stop. So if you see here is 2.8, it's not giving you detail. In eight, it's not giving you detail but in 22 the higher it goes the better details you can see so we need a camera system with a good uh, f-stop at least of 22 millimeter okay now this is the way you can see the extra oral way okay if the f-stop is less then you see the picture like this the same person you see the face look suddenly two out. And as you increase the depth of focus, you get the correct image of the patient, okay? So F-stop should be, the higher it is, the better is it. So at the um, focal length of 135, your pictures looks much better. Okay, then you have need the retractors. The retractors you're going to buy should be like this, in which there is a very wide retractor and other end is a very narrow retractor. When you take the pictures, you always use the wide end. When you put this into a patient mouth, they will complain that the cheeks are stretching here, it's hurting. Then you put, um, inform the patient and do it very gently in a way that you not uh, hurt the sulcus. But you need a full stretch to get the mucogingival junction pictures, okay? And all the frenum attachment. So it should be the full mouth visibility for orthodontic pictures. Then you have a lip retractors. The lip retractors, you use it when you take the orthodontic uh, occlusal photographs. So there are two ways of doing orthodontic occlusal photographs. You can do the lip retractor one, or you can use the two cheek retractor in the upward or downward motion, okay? 
then you need an intraoral mir mirrors. So there are different types of the mirrors. Now this mirror is a stainless steel mirror in which is uh, both sides are reflected, okay? They have a different shapes. So this shape you can use in the adult with a wide jaw. This one you can use in the kid. And this one you can use for the buckle photographs. So indirect buckle photographs, you can use this mirror, okay? What is the benefit of using the stainless steel mirror is it can't be break. So if it's drop, it's not a issue. It is inexpensive and it can be sterilized with autoclave. What is a problem with this mirror is only scratches. So after two or three use, you will feel that there are too many scratches. So when you buy such mirrors, you have to tell uh, your assistant that don't keep it with all the instruments and go into the wash. When you get the mirror, you wash it, dry it, and clean it separately and pack it, okay? And don't you mix it with probes and other instruments because it can get scratch, okay? So you just need to have a special instructions uh, to keep the life longer, but anyways, you will get scratches over the period of time. Why we want this one, uh, the, other, the polish metal one, because whatever you see is a real image, okay? So it's a very true uh, visibility. The other type of the mirrors are called rhodium coated mirrors. These rhodium coated mirrors have a very good optical properties, like you can take the best photographs, okay? But the problem is with the rhodium coated mirrors are, it is breakable, it is very expensive, and you can't sterilize them. You can see it here, the tips are metal, okay? You always can do the spray disinfection only. So when you do the spray disinfection, uh, it happened that sometimes the patient have a disease, which we now in COVID, we have to be very careful that everything either disposable or uh, go to the autoclave. So rhodium coated mirrors are not uh, worthwhile to spend just for to get a very beautiful photographs. Then you have a glass mirror face mirrors. Uh, never buy these ones. The reason is that uh, they look good when you see them, but they are very cheap. They can break, okay? And they always give you a distorted picture. They don't give you the accurate reflection of the face. So the mirrors, what we use in the house, is called as a, in the, for our dressing table, they are glass mirrors. These mirrors are not uh, be used for intraoral photography. And the reason why they can't be used because whatever light they go, they, they come out with a different uh, distortion. It not come out 100% what the image is. It come out as distorted, okay? Now coming to the intraoral photograph, these are six photographs that you have to take it for every patient. First photograph is your front picture with full uh, stretch. Uh, you can see all the frenum and the right side and left side should be equally exposed. Uh, then is the overjet picture. Then there is a buckle two picture and occlusal two pictures. We go in detail. So for intraoral photographs, according to American Board of Orthodontics, there is a requirement. When you want to present into the American Board of Orthodontics, there is a certain requirement for your pictures, otherwise they will not accept it for uh, recognition purpose. And these requirements are very nice to learn because this help you to build your skip on the right platform. That, you know, my pictures should be up to that level, so it can be accepted in any journal and it can be published with, um, with the confidence, right? So the guidelines is that your picture should have a quality um, print, should be standardized and should be colored, okay? The patient dentition oriented accurately in all three planes of 
active phase, one frontal view in maximum intercuspation, two lateral views right and left, optional two occlusal view of the maxilla and the mandible. They are free of distraction by using the, uh, there should be no retractors or labels or finger uh, in the picture. The quality lightning, which relieves anatomical contours and make it makes the image free of shadows. The tongue should be retracted when you're taking the lower mandibular jaw. The pictures should be free of saliva and bubbles and the dentition need to be clean. So always rem remember when you're taking the pictures, always do the scaling, polishing first, restoration first, and then you take the patient records. Then what is the process? You have to take the consent of the patient for any photography. You have to seat the patient on the dental chair, ask them to lean it in, at the back, and then your camera should be at least 20 centimeter distance. And you can do a test trial, just a image to see how clear and sharp the image is coming. And then you do the particular uh, pictures with retractions. So the position of the camera is there. Uh, you can do the occlusal pictures from the top, and then you can do the lateral view and the frontal buckle pictures and the frontal pictures while coming in front of the patient. Okay, you always need an assistant who can help you out to retract the cheeks uh, with precision. If you don't have a dental assistant, then the patient sometimes help you, but then they can't stretch their lips. So you have to train patient by showing them in the mirror how you want it to be stretched, or you can have a trained assistant who can help you out. So for the frontal picture, if you can see this picture and this picture, what's the difference you can see? There is a problem in this picture. The picture problem is that the right side is more visible than the left side. But here, if you see right and left, both are equally exposed. So the frontal, the top and bottom should be equally exposed. And if it is not, then you do the cropping yourself. Yeah, but make sure that right and left should be equally exposed. So what are the requirements for the frontal view? It shows the appearance of the teeth to the patient. Use large end of the retractors to take the picture pulling soft tissue laterally and forward. So you can ask the patient or assistant to put the retractor, push it, the cheeks laterally and forward. Okay, so you can see whole dentition to the end. Okay, that's the rule. And that's the tip. Occlusal, uh, horizontal occlusal frame and bisecting the picture. So you should have the grid on on your camera. So you can see that your midline is in middle your op and your uh, occlusal plane is parallel to the grid. The midline is in center of the frame, equal exposure of the right and left side. Center of the image is in con uh, is contact point of the upper incisor. So, there is always a cursor, right? So where are you going to put a cursor? The cursor you're going to put the center of the image is the point of, of upper incisors, okay? And the edge of the photo is in the vestibular aureus, okay? So if you see this picture and this picture, this one is overly cropped. So I should actually take a little bit down this one I have over stretched. I can cut it up to this point. Okay. So your cropping and your dimensions should be perfect. Then coming to the buckle view, giving the details of the mal occlusion close to the maximum occlusion. So all these pictures should be in a biting position the front one and the buckle view. Horizontal occlusal plane. Uh, should be horizontal, so they should not be tilted. You have to make it straight, okay? And then you have to tilt your camera so that how you do the basing of the model, even the patient have the curve of his feet or, but when you do the models, you make the occlusal plane straight. 
So same, when you're taking a picture, you tilt your camera, but make sure your occlusal plane is, is straight, okay? You can also use the mirrors. The mirror I showed you uh, in the first picture, uh, you can put on the side and then you take a picture of the mirror. This mirror, you can use it when uh, you can't able to stretch too much, then you use a mirror, okay? Now, where you put a cursor when you take a buckle view, you put it at second premolar or first molar. So your cursor should either be here or here. So you need to stretch it so much that your cursor should be in second premolar or first molar. The minimum requirement is you should see the full of whole of the first molar. If you can see the second molar, it's good. You are fortunate. I can see a second molar, but my first molar should be completely visible. It should not be covered, okay? Then coming to the occlusal view, use the small end of the retractor downward and upward direction. So now you can use one lip retractor or you can use, like I use this uh, normal cheek retractors, but I use a small ends of it and I use it upward and downward direction in the middle. So you can, and here you can put upward, downward and uh, backward direction in the lower. Okay, so that you see all the teeth without any distraction of the retractors. Tilt head of the patient backward, ask patient to open the mouth completely, touch the upper and lower incisors, and place distal to the first molar. Okay, so you're, when you're putting the mirror, you have to see that your picture should at least include first molar completely and the back as much as you can. So all the teeth should come into the, in, in the occlusion should be visible in the mirror, okay? So the upper one is very easy. You can put the mirror as back as you can, but when you're taking the lower picture, taking the third molar picture is very difficult. So even the half of the second molar is coming, it's fine, okay? because you is asking patient to stretch their tongue and the tongue should not come into the uh, occlusion. It's very difficult. You have to pull the patient tongue at the back. So you should take a rule that first molar should be there and the second molar can come as much as you can, okay? If you have more number of the teeth in the mouth, you can do the space analysis as well. Extend from the front of the incisor till distal end of the first molar. Ideally include all erupted teeth, okay? Now coming to the overjet view. When you're taking the overjet view, you have to, now you're taking a buckle picture, then you bend your retractors, okay? And you put a white background, ask your assistant to put a white background and you take a picture 90 degrees so you can, see the overjet and you see the one incisor, not two incisors, one incisors, and you can measure the overjet perfectly. So you should, what you have to do, you put the white background first, then how you do any of the white paper or anything, you put a background there, then you use a large retractor to and push the retractors backwards, and then uh, extend the picture from canine to incisor, okay? So we need to see the canine and the incisors in a maximum occlusion in a side view, okay, at 90 degree. Now this all comes with a practice. The more you practice your photography, the more you get the angles. Coming to the extra oral photographs, extra oral photographs are very important. They also should be in a standardized condition at constant distance constant camera setting and constant quality of the light and precise positioning. So what I do in my practice, I have a particular zone in my clinic where I ask patient to stand to take a picture and I know from where I have to take it. So I take all the patient pictures from a certain angle and from certain place with a certain light situation. If I keep changing my location in the clinic, I have to change the light source. I have to deal with the focus uh, and the shadow issues. So the best thing is that 
you enter in your clinic and you just ask your assistant to stay, uh, the background should be white. So if stand in different places and you try to take a picture and see at what position there is no shadow. So you can utilize the daylight. You, in four walls, there must be some place where you can get a picture without any shadow, right? So you can get the picture of the patient and uh, ask your assistant to, then you know your correct position, at what position in the clinic, there is no shadows. And this, you categorize, this is my photography station and all the patients should come and stay there with a certain distance and you take a picture there. So what are the American board requirements for the extraoral photographs? Again, the quality and standardized photographs, um, either the black and white or color, both are accepted. The patient had oriented accurately in all three plane of space and in the Frankfurt horizontal plane. How you do it, ask patient to look straight. That's it. Don't look up, don't look down, just look straight. On lateral view, facing to the right. So don't ask patient to turn left and take a picture and then try to take the mirror. Always ask the patient to face to the right and their lips should be relaxed, not tightly uh, closed or too much open there should be a relaxed, the pictures should be in a relaxed position. If patient can't able to close their lips, ask them to relax it. We can deal with the disharmony, okay? But don't try to force anything. Just be relaxed. Look straight and be relaxed. One anterior view with a serious expression, optional one lateral view, and one anterior view with lips apart in a smiling position. Optional one, anterior with a smiling, and the background should be free of distraction, should be white color, should be a quality, having a quality lightning. There should be no shadows in the background. Ears should be fully exposed. The eyes should be open, looking straight, and patients should not wear their glasses while having a pictures. So this is the extra oral pictures of the patient. If you see this patient, what you can find is the you have to do the cropping at the level of the clavicle, okay? And then you give some space on the top, some space on the right, some space on the left. The patient should look straight, yeah? So there are one, two, three, four, six pictures. Two are the smile close-up. One is a straight smile close-up. The third one is a three-quarter smile close-up. And how you get four of these pictures, here the patient looking straight in a camera at their Frankfurt horizontal. Then here the patient neck should not be overextended, should be straight, should looking straight and no smile. Then you take two smiling picture, ask patient to smile in three quarters and ask patient to smile while looking at you, okay? So let's go in detail in the frontal view. The standing or sitting against the white background should be at the same height. So if the patient is uh, shorter than you, then you have to bend down. If the patient is taller than you, then your camera should be uh, pushed up. Like you have to put your hand up at the level of the patient height, okay? and tell patient, don't look at me, look at the camera, okay? You have to look straight, you have to look straight in the camera, okay? The camera can go up, the camera can go down. The focus on lower eyelid, middle of the face. When you're doing the face picture, your cursor should be lower eyelid and the middle of the face, okay? And it's always in a portrait format, not in the horizontal, okay? So keep it in the portrait format. Don't think that you can make a landscape and you can change it, it not come correctly. When there is a landscape needed, you do the landscape. When the portrait is needed, take a picture in the portrait. Extend from the top of the head 
till the clavicle or the, or the larynx. The picture should be bilaterally symmetrical, so equal exposure of the ears, okay? Interpupillary line should be parallel to the floor, so the hat should be straight. It's very important to use the grid while you're doing the uh, take a pictures. It should be in the natural hat position, look straight in the camera. There should be no shadows. If you see here, you can see a shadow here. And this is not acceptable. Here you can see a shadows. I should have placed patient into a, another wall and try the same picture, okay? The lips should be relaxed, not strained at rest. There should be a natural smile, not the forced smile. On the lateral profile view, you can ask patient turn to the right and only right view is required, not the left. But in case the patient have a facial asymmetry, then you have to take right and left face, okay? Extend top of the head till the clavicle in natural uh, head position with lips relaxed. Exposed ear completely. So you see the full ear. Ask patient to tie the hair or put the hair at the back. Looking is straight and there should be no shadows here. Okay, so you can see full face line with no shadows. The three quarter view, the mid face deformities to rule out the mid face deformity, the class three patients, we use this view. So this is very important. Ask patient to turn their head at 45 degree, okay, till you see the contour of the eyes. So you can see this whole eye and this, you can see this half of this eye or the contour of the eyes, okay? And ask patient to smile and then you take the picture. The focus is again at the level lower eyelid or the mid face. Then you go to the close up smile. It's basically the crop of these two pictures, but actually you have to take a separate pictures for close up. So when you try to zoom it, it come in perfect resolution. Then there is one additional view, which is called as a submental view. It should be taken in only in the case of facial asymmetry, especially mandibular asymmetry. You can ask patient to look up and you take a picture from the bottom. 